this? Here, watch. At Packard Bell, we torture test every computer we make so they can pass the toughest test of all. Home. See? He was out. Packard Bell, the computer the world comes home to. In this video, let's talk about Packard Bell's blistering rise to prominence. How they emerged as the market leader of the 90s US consumer computer market for a period before eventually accruing financial losses that caused the brand to be removed from the US market less than a decade later. But let me take you back to the mid 80s to give you a flavor of the time. The rapid evolution of the personal computer into a multimedia powerhouse was coinciding with an explosion of mainstream interest in home PC ownership. And Packard Bell arrived precisely at the right time with its razor sharp retail pricing, aggressive business model, and its ability to foresee and deliver exactly what the average consumer desired. These three primary strategies gave them the first mover advantage for most of those short but incredibly exciting years. The upshot is that for many that grew up in that decade, a Packard Bell branded machine has a very high chance of being your first home computer. How many of you remember Navigator or using DOS and Windows for the very first time with one of these machines? But to comprehend how it then all went spectacularly wrong so fast for this little startup, we have to start at the beginning of the story. We start with its three co-founders, led by the charismatic Benny Alajem, a 32-year-old Israeli immigrant, and his two co-founders, 32-year-old Jason Barzilay and 42-year-old Alex Sandel. These three had already created a successful semiconductor and peripheral business together in Southern California, and now they wanted to jump feet first into the high growth market of consumer electronics. And Benny had a very cunning plan. You see, their strategy anticipated that the US consumer PC market was rapidly opening up with the introduction of IBM compatible clones. They believed that the computer business in general was ready to move towards a commodity-based industry characterized by low margins and high volume sales. If they could tap into the huge market potential and get their product offering correct, then theoretically they would be able to turn a significant profit. They had identified that 70% of homes in the US didn't have a personal computer and many of the other 30% that did had old technology. They were targeting household penetration. Through a brilliant early marketing strategy in 1985, Benny bought a dormant brand name with a rich history and symbolic recognition with the US population. For $100,000, he bought the rights to the brand name Packard Bell. Consumers either remembered the brand from the previous incarnation of that company, which sold quality radios and TVs from the 20s to the 70s, or postulated incorrectly that it was some offshoot of Hewlett Packard or the Bell Corporation. In either case, it unconsciously brought a level of consumer confidence to the product line, which paid dividends very quickly, as we will see in a moment. Incorporated in 1986, Packard Bell Electronics Inc. was born. They contracted Asian suppliers and manufacturers to design and build their product line. Their first computers then hit the shelves in 1987, but being not particularly spectacular hardware-wise, they had to implement smart marketing strategies to differentiate themselves enough to generate high volume sales. Using the ambiguous but compelling theme of America grew up listening to us, it still does. As a sales slogan, it riffed on those memories of the Packard Bell brand. This gave the Packard Bell computers instant credibility, which was often a significant game changer when a consumer was choosing which IBM clone to purchase. 
But this wasn't their only angle of attack. They were innovators that kept the end user firmly in focus. For example, they were among the first to equip their computers with both three and a half and five and a quarter inch drives, which was a boon to users who were upgrading their PCs, allowing them to still use their older floppy media and smooth the upgrade transition. They also put in hard drives, which were comparatively large for the time, but still managed to keep their recommended retail price lower than their competitors. Notably, they also became the first company to pre-install software with their computers, allowing a streamlined installation and setup at home, which significantly reduced the friction for the mainstream technologically inexperienced masses to buy into computer ownership. But the key differentiator at the time was their novel distribution method, how they got the PCs in front of the average Joe. Traditionally, PCs had been sold in dedicated computer stores or via specialized sales reps. Packard Bell instead decided to risk selling via established mass retail sales channels, selling its computers through giant retail stores like Sears, Circuit City, an office depot, discount change, warehouse stores, or electronics and appliance centers. Packard Bell was going to market and sell direct to the end user via these consumer channels and entice them in with easy to use computers with low prices. The competitors thought this was crazy, but the percentage of PCs sold via this method rose from 4% in 1987 to 12% in 1992, and Packard Bell was the main beneficiary. By 1992, in fact, Packard Bell controlled 26% of this specific distribution channel and would place a stranglehold on it by increasing its share to more than 45% by the mid-90s. In 1989, Packard Bell generated an estimated $600 million in annual sales, and this increased to $700 million by 1991. As they sold their computers via retail, they provided retail-style services to support their products. They offered round-the-clock toll-free telephone support and provided a one-year warranty with on-site service. Keeping up with the broader technological advances, they also set up dedicated bulletin board services on Prodigy and CompuServe. This was truly explosive growth for a company that had only started in 1986, and further growth was certainly to come for another few years. But challenges and challenges were emerging. In 1991, Packard Bell began selling in Europe, and through 1992, they had found the same retail strategy was effective. In 1992, Packard Bell earned 10% of its sales from its European arm, and expected that number to double the next year. They opened up a facility in the Netherlands to cope with demand, and it included a customer support team that provided technical advice in 12 languages. Sales continued to blossom, rising to more than $900 million in 1992, and then to $1.25 billion in 1993. They continued to dominate mass market retail channels, leading to Packard Bell becoming the fourth leading computer supplier in the US behind IBM, Apple, and Compaq. They owned 6.7% of the market share in 1993, and in Europe, they had rapidly established 1,500 retail outlets throughout 13 countries. In 1993, they also attracted investment from computer maker Group Bull of France, who bought a 19.9% .9 share of Packard Bell, investing in an estimated $50 million. They also received $100 million in financing from Congress Financial Corp of New York. Both of these cash infusions helped Packard Bell's balance sheet considerably. Moving into 1994, they continued to expand its foreign markets in Australia, Europe, Asia, and South America. Moreover, they introduced a new series of multimedia machines, which included computers that could be used with newfangled compact discs. Being able to adjust to shifting consumer demands helped to keep them on top of the tree for a short while longer. However, 
These competitors, as well as some new entrants, were studying Packard Bell's tactics and were beginning to fight back. On top of this, the strategy of maximizing sales with low margins was perilous. An example of the razor-thin margin is of Circuit City selling a Packard Bell Legend 115 for $899, only $50 more than what they pay Packard Bell wholesale for the machine. Even back in 1992, many financial analysts were questioning whether Packard Bell would survive the market's relentless price cutting and cutthroat competition. Although sales were growing at five times the industry average, its profits were nosediving due to the heavy price cuts they had to introduce to keep ahead of their competitors. I will be talking through Packard Bell's next phase in the second part of this video. Their fall from grace, how the competition heated up and how they were eventually sold and shut down. Stay tuned for the next installment. Now, although I've researched this, it is always easy for a mistake to make its way in. If you spotted one, then please call it out in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, then give it a like, a dislike if you didn't, and consider subscribing for more content. And I'll see you in the next one.